Uh, welcome to Thinking Aloud. Uh, I'm not Marcus Smith. I'm just playing him on radio <laughs> for today. Our guest is Gillen Darcy Wood, who's professor of English at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he's the author of several books uh, and articles. Among these books, uh, The Shock of the Real, Romanticism and Visual Culture, 1760-1860, and published in 2001. Romanticism and Music Culture in Britain, 1770 to 1840, published in 2010, and the book about which we'll be talking with him today, uh, called Tambora, The Eruption That Changed the World, published last year from Princeton University Press. He's in town for a symposium on the future of the environmental humanities being held here at BYU and at the University of Utah. And he's also the guest of BYU's Romantic and Victorian Research Group, sponsored by our Humanities Center. Welcome, Gillen, to BYU. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Matt. It's great to have you here. Um, I've got to ask you about the, uh, the inspiration behind your latest book. The book you wrote before that, the one on romanticism and music culture in Britain, you mentioned in the preface there that you were a musician as uh, a youth, and you thought you might have professional aspirations. So now you move from a book on music to a book on violent weather patterns. So did you have you know, sort of aspirations to be a meteorologist as a child? <laughs> no, no, nothing like that. I was uh, um, the world's worst science student, as a matter of fact. You know, completely uh, lazy and, and uncurious. <laughs> and have, have come to, the, to a, a, a great interest in science later in life. There are a couple of light bulb moments for me, I think. Um, one having to do with, uh, with climate change and, a, and mm. a turn in my interest toward um, looking at antecedents uh, to our, the climate predicament that we face in the 21st century and, and thinking how could I turn the training that I do have in 19th century history and culture to contributing to ongoing research into, into climate change and human adaptability to, environmental, to an environmental crisis that is global. And the other one, and toward that end, I managed to acquire a fellowship in studying in a second, second discipline at the University of Illinois, and I spent a semester sitting in atmospheric science classes. Mm -hmm. And in one of them, there was a, one lecture was on uh, volcanology and the relationship between volcanism and climate. Uh, and true to form, it was a subject about which I knew nothing. Um, and the name Tambora came up again and again in the course of the, uh, the professor's lecture on the subject. And here it was, this massive eruption, probably the greatest in the last 10,000 years on planet Earth, 1815. And I didn't even know, I barely knew the name. I didn't know, I thought perhaps it was in Sicily. I had no idea uh, <laughs> about it at all. And, uh, I mean, the Greeks say that, uh, you know, good things come from shame. In fact, often only, only good things come only from feelings of shame you know, that motivate us toward behaving better and... and um, producing good works. And certainly it was a wave of shame that overcame me in the course of the lecture, thinking this is a central geological event in the middle of a period that I've been studying for 15 or 20 years and have built my career upon, and yet I know nothing about it. And uh, I knew immediately that the only proper penance that I could serve <laughs> uh, for, for my ignorance was to spend five or six years researching uh, this topic and writing the book, which didn't yet exist on, right. on the global uh, consequences of this this massive uh, geological event um, two centuries ago. Well, it's a great book. It's a great read. And it's interesting about it. It's, it's both the book for academics and for an educated, non-specialized readership. I mean, it really, it tells a, a very compelling story. It's surprising that there wasn't a book about this. It surprised me when I read it because of the, the picture you set forth of, of the massive effects this volcano had for many years afterwards, this eruption had. Um, just how big was this? You said the biggest in the last 10,000 years. People might know about Krakatoa, for example, uh, late 19th century eruption. Uh, how big was this eruption, and where is Tambora? Hmm. Well, Tambora is located on the Pacific Ring of Fire, so-called. So a whole chain of volcanoes that run through Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Um, it's not far from Krakatoa. It's not far from the islands of Java and Bali. and uh, it's uh, relative to Krakatoa. See, this is the, the, the question that would, I would continually face is, oh, so you're, you're, you're the one writing on Krakatoa because it is the iconic <laughs> right. 19th century Southeast Asian volcano. And I would have to correct them and say, no, I'm actually writing on a volcano that was um, three or four times the size. Mm. 
and there would be a look of astonishment, <laughs> and I would follow up with explaining why right. it was that Krakatoa benefited from the revolution in, in global communications in the, in the mid-19th century, where you have the telegraph and the steamship. So news of Krakatoa's eruption was able to spread around the globe within a day, whereas uh, uh, Tambora in 1815, before the telegraph, and of course in the midst of the Napoleonic Wars, or the conclusion of the Napoleonic Wars, it was really happening on the periphery of Western global consciousness, and there was no means of communicating the disaster. And even so, there was no link between the uh, the disaster that engulfed the uh, the, the area that was then the Dutch East Indies and the cataclysmic extreme weather events that unfolded globally in the three years following. There was no scientific means right. for people in Europe or North America to make, or anywhere else, to make the connection between the volcanic event and the climate deterioration that followed. That would have to wait until the, late, the latter part of the 20th century. Right. So, you know, the book couldn't, you ask why hasn't the book been written? There is a lag or a, um, a uh, discontinuity between the historical archive, the fragmented historical archive surrounding the eruption of Krakatoa, the bad weather across the globe, and then the scientific literature that comes, say, from 1950 onwards, which enables us to connect the dots between the eruption and the... Uh, the various weather events around the world that that, um, that followed in the aftermath. I want to get to these weather events um, because, I mean, you really uh, tell a very interesting story about things that happened as far away as you know, India and the United States and in China and not just in around the islands of the East Indies or today Indonesia. How was it that Tambor was able to create these weather events? You talk about both the size of the eruption but also the location of the volcano. You say this wouldn't have happened had it been, say, in Iceland. Correct. Why is that? Yeah, the physics of uh, volcanic eruptions and their impact on global weather depends on their latitude. So North Atlantic volcanoes, uh, their erupted um, volcanic matter into the atmosphere does not enter the global circulation system. Uh, so a volcano needs to be somewhere near the equator. And uh, Tambora is located at six degrees south of the equator, so perfectly positioned. Um, it also erupted its uh, uh, magma uh, sufficiently beyond the atmosphere, actually 40 kilometres up into the stratosphere. So height is an incredibly important factor. People often ask me about Mount St. Helens. It's like, well, it's St. Helens. Clearly right. something comparable, but not really. A much smaller eruption. And also that eruption blew out the side of the, the mountain. Mm. And so its impact on climate was nil. So there has to be a certain height attained whereby the, the aerosols from the volcano can escape the world's weather, the global weather system, not be precipitated out by rain, and therefore form a kind of um, screen, volcanic dust veil, up uh, in the stratosphere uh, that then um, the, the, uh, blocks the sunlight and forms a kind of uh, radiative barrier and cooling the, cooling the globe. Okay, and then that, that global cooling... Um, and this is really interesting. I wonder if you could talk about a couple places. So, for example, it had uh, effects on India uh, and China. Uh, let's talk. About, I want to get to the Arctic in a minute because there's a great chapter in your book about the Arctic, and there's a great one about the United States and about Ireland. Quickly, what happened in India? Uh, what happened in China as a function of this massive eruption? Okay, so the uh, the India chapter, the India example is a particularly interesting one. And again, would not have been poss could not have been written without very recent developments in um, epi epidemiological research on the relationship between climate and disease ecology. In this case, cholera. So the first link in the chain of causation between Tambora's eruption and epidemical cholera in, in India is the depression of the Indian monsoon in the years following the eruption. So in 1816 and 1817. The Indian monsoon is the largest, most dynamic weather system in the world. It, it contains more energy than, than any other. And because it, it depends on a thermal differentiation between land and sea, that the, uh, the physical fact that, um, that heat in the atmosphere warms the land more quickly than it warms water in the Bay of Bengal and in the Indian Ocean. Now, if you have a... a uh, a context of global uh, cooling, 
a thermal deficit, then you that differentiation between the heat of the land and sea is reduced, and therefore the energy is reduced in the entire monsoonal system. So in 1816 and, and 17, you have a, a decrepit monsoon, a, a, a vastly diminished monsoon, and delayed rains. So you have um, a crop failure in the first instance, uh, and drought that follow, which is and once the the the, the monsoon belatedly churns back to life, you have um, it's the opposite forms of extreme weather. You have a hundred year floods, and both these conditions, drought, extreme drought followed by flood events, <laughs> turns out to be especially conducive toward uh, the production of the cholera microbe, or the production and reproduction of cholera microbe, and its change of state, so variations in the cholera microbe. And this is what happened in 1816 uh, in the Bay of Bengal, which is it's where um, cholera has been endemic for time immemorial. Now, what happened in 1816 was that you had these extreme weather events and the depressed monsoon um, causing a kind of new chapter in, the, in the, the global life of the cholera. It changes shape, it enters into the waterways of the human community in the Bay of Bengal, and instead of being uh, merely an, another endemic um, uh, uh, episode in the history of the cholera in that community, because it has changed its state, it now finds a host of fresh victims. So a, an endemic disease, right. cholera, suddenly had takes on epidemical proportions right. and potentialities. And the, those, that potential is so great that, in fact, the worldwide human population becomes a, a kind of potential new host for this, for this epidemic cholera. So epidemiological historians now locate the beginning of modern cholera, global cholera, in Bengal in 1816, the year after Tambora, the first epidemic, the first global epidemic. We're currently in the seventh but the first epidemic dates from 1816, 1817 and can be directly linked back to Tambora. The global death toll from this cholera in the 19th century runs in the tens of millions. Wow. So it's impossible to imagine the global 19th century as it was without cholera. Uh, it really shaped, it shaped societies, it shaped our modern global health institutions, it shaped modern governance in so many ways. It's, an extraordinarily, it's extraordinarily central to the history of the 19th century. And the argument I make in the book which is, um, I think, proof, we fall short of proof. Proof is beyond us, but there's a very, very strong circ circumstantial evidence linking the uh, eruption of Tambora to the, to the evolution of cholera in 1860. That's fascinating. In the chapter on China, you talk, there's, there's, a, there's a link between Tambora, and I've got to mention, by the way, for those, I, I, I urge people to sort of get this book, there's some great images in the book. The, the one of Tambora itself, present-day Tambora, there's, huge mountain with this big trough, this caldera in the middle of it. You talk about this, about a mile of the mountain got blown apart by this. You see, it's the size of the eruption was massive. The effects of the eruption um, couldn't be seen until later in ways like this cholera epidemic. In the chapter on China, you make the link between uh, this eruption and a few years later, uh, you know, sort of uh, opium trade. Yeah. How does that work? I, I took for my inspiration um, a, a model of causation that climate scientists use, they talk to try to understand the ways in which um, the climate system and extreme weather patterns develop across the globe. Uh, the word they use is teleconnection, which translated means you know, remote, a remote relation between cause and effect. I mean, if we think about El Nino patterns and, and how, well, in California, for instance, they're hoping that the El Nino that is developing this year will bring a break to the drought, will bring a lot of rain. It should do that. And so those impacts in California begin off the west coast of uh, Latin America because it's the warming of the seas, a warming of the ocean on the west coast of uh, Latin America that is um, uh, the generator of El Nino. also has big impacts on weather systems in Australia, for instance, where I'm from. So it has global impacts. And the only way of thinking about this, you can't, it, it, one needs to think about, one needs to think trans-hemispherically and uh, in, in the ways in which these uh, events, these alterations in the climate system work according to a time lag and over great, um, over great distances. So this was the model for the book, that the tambora is a, an, a, a massive geological 
perturbation that affects the climate system over a span of years, in this case three to four years, but over vast territory. I mean, the impact is large enough to affect the entire system. You have a, a, a volcanic envelope around the entire globe. Right. Um, so in the specific case of China, uh, well, I've t talked about the, the disruption to the disease ecology of the Bay of Bengal, uh, but the two narratives that I follow mostly follow along two lines. That is um, disease, the um, the change in disease vectors, and particularly the vulnerability of human communities across the globe to to, um, to disease and epidemical disease in this period. Um, and the other one is global food shortages. So the disruption to crops and to the, sh the shortening of growing seasons across the world. So the, Ch the China example is a, is a terrific one um, uh, where the effects were particularly deadly. You have a, a, a community entirely dependent, mostly dependent on a rice crop and you have, uh, and rice is an extremely hardy crop. I mean, it, it feel it it um, it is the staple crop for staple crop for more than fifty percent of the globe's population. I mean, it's a great crop, but it has one Achilles heel, and that is cold temperatures in the in the summertime. Okay, uh, and that's exactly what Tambora delivers, not for just one year. And right. the China, of course, has its much vaunted granary system dating back millennia so precisely to protect against bad seasons but the the thing about climate change of this kind is that it goes beyond the normal parameters of weather deterioration and so you've got you have six or seven growing seasons you know three or four years of of um, crop yields that are 20 or 25 per, uh, percent of the normal um, and some seasons where almost nothing is grain at all. So you have people, very soon, you have um, the population is starving. You have emergency famine conditions. And this was what was happening across the entire prosperous province of, of Yuna. You have slave markets for children opening up. You have infanticide. You have corpses by the road. You have a, a, a human emergency of the most drastic proportions. Uh, and it was in the aftermath of, of that terrible period uh, of the late 18 teens in China that you begin to see uh, Yunnanese farmers converting their, their crops from rice to opium. Because opium is a much more reliable cash crop. So they, their reasoning is that in times of, future times of famine, they will be able to uh, raise money in order to buy grain, in order to buy rice for their families on the market, which is precisely what they lacked during the Tambora emergency. They could no, couldn't grow rice of their, their own, nor could they buy it on the market where prices were sky high. And so there was a collect, you know, there was a, a, a almost instant transfer of arable land over to opium, which turned out to be a much more reliable crop for them. And now here we are 200 years later, and that area has been for decades now the center of global opium production. It's the so-called gro um, uh, golden triangle. Right. <laughs> Interesting uh, legacy uh, yes. of one eruption 200 years ago. Yes. Um, you, the, one of the chapters in the book tells a really interesting story about the United States mm. uh, and about the effects of this eruption on climate, uh, on weather for three years in the U.S. And you talk about this great debate over weather between uh, Comte de Buffon, uh, the, the French uh, scientist, and Thomas Jefferson. There's a line actually in uh, the book, which is very striking for present day circumstances. You say uh, that following Jefferson's legacy to suggest that the American climate is bad or getting worse is, uh, in a historical sense, unpatriotic. Hmm. Can you explain the context of that remark in terms of what, what happened, what Tambora did to the climate and what it did to Jefferson's own philosophy about the climate? Yeah, I think we have to go back to the 17th century and to the colonial and pre uh, the pre-revolutionary and colonial period, where there is a strain of anti-colonial sentiment in in Europe, sustained by writers such as William Robinson in, in his multi-volume History of America, which is very influential, and by the Comte de Buffon, um, where their their thesis was. Um, about the uh, North America was that it was essentially uncongenial uh, to both human and animal populations uh, because it, uh, it was too cold. Uh, the, the, the winters were too severe. And uh, uh, Buffon wrote about how his, his theory of, the, of degeneration from, the new, from old world to new. 
and that even species, that species including humans, transported from the new world, old world context to the new world would necessarily degenerate. And of course, this is not uh, a positive message. Uh, <laughs> clearly, no. this is a, a meme uh, which needs to be pushed back against by right. the, um, the intellectuals and politicians uh, in the United States. And so the ultimate intellectual politician, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, spends a great deal of time pushing back against this anti-colonial theory of um, uh, climate pessimism that surrounds the, United, surrounds the United States. And you have, you know, the encouragement for, for migration and the attempt to build up the, the US population. It's, it's not good to have a theory, a degenerate, degenerative theory of American climate out there as right. a as popu in popular belief. Um, so climate optimism is a very important part of the work of early American intellectuals and scientists and politicians. And this is why in, in only a few years before the eruption of Tambora, you have an acolyte of, of um, Thomas Jefferson in uh, Vermont, writing the history of Vermont, in which he talks about how the clearing of the forests and the bringing of the land under the plough has ameliorated the climate, has ushered in warmer winds and better weather and a more uh, a more congenial uh, a, a more congenial climate, and is will probably in, increase the average temperature annual temperature by ten degrees Fahrenheit. And in the book, I actually put that, I put a little, I allow myself a little exclamation point in parentheses <laughs> after that, a particular projection that, that, the, that, the, that um, North America would warm by 10 degrees. Um, and then, of course, he, he says this at the outset of the coldest decade in American history. So you have this, this tradition of climate optimism coming up against the Tambora event yeah. and the late 18 teens, which are the coldest years in American history. And that as a kind of uh, a, a terrible shock, a psychological shock uh, and a, a collective national trauma. You have entire village, villages yes, in uh, Vermont and New Hampshire packing up and heading west. It's the first major demographic shift from the East Coast uh, to the West. Joseph Smith's family, they leave That's right. Vermont and head to, head to New York State. Uh, it's part of this movement to the West um, because people were, star were starving, were afraid of starvation conditions. They th felt that perhaps con the Conte de Buffon was right after all. And um, <laughs> you have the shortest growing seasons on record all through New Hampshire, Massachusetts, New York. Um, so it's a, sh it's a real shock to the system. And it's not taught in our schools. It's not really in the history books how important the eight, late 18 teens were uh, at, as a... Um, sort of recalibration of American ideals vis-a-vis -vis climate and agriculture. Um, how, and Thomas Jefferson down in Monticello is writing about, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do if the seasons continue right. to be so uncongenial to our agriculture. And he ends up losing Monticello. Um, I mean, he was right. already in debt, but tam the Tambora years are the last straw for him. Right. And he describes the westward migration in these years as an avalanche. Those are his words. Um, so, uh, of course, the, the twist in the tale for this story is that there is, um, that there is a massive boom for the, for the frontier west, what is now the Midwest, Illinois, Ohio, Pennsylvania. You have uh, six times the amount of grain being shipped down the Mississippi to New Orleans to be shipped to the Atlantic seaboard and to Europe in the years after 1815. So you have a boom, a huge land investment. And then in 1819, when the global weather systems return to normal, and the grain-growing regions of the Atlantic seaboard and Western Europe and Eastern Europe come back online, then, of course, you know, logic tells you um, that uh, the bottom falls out of commodity prices. Right. Grain prices return to normal, and everybody, everybody who's invested in the Midwest loses their shirts. <laughs> so you have the first Great American Depression, which is known to historians as the Panic of 1819. Right. And so the, we can connect the Panic of 1819, an economic event, no, yeah. again, by, t by virtue of teleconnection, right. Right. You make the sequence and you bring it back again to the, to the eruption of Tambora. That's right. It certainly wouldn't have occurred without Tambora. Oh, that's fascinating. We have maybe two minutes left. Briefly, people, I think, uh, may not have heard of Tambora, but they have 
uh, many people have read uh, romantic literature that was indirectly affected by Tambor. I'm thinking about Frankenstein, for mm -hmm. example. You make that connection in the book. Briefly for those uh, out there who love novels, uh, that, that novel, uh, another romantic text like this, how did Tambora create the conditions really for imagining a text like Frankenstein? Yeah, uh, well, Mary Shelley, when she was 18 years old, and uh, as I explained it to my own students, there are a, a bunch of college-age kids on a European vacation <laughs> hoping to spend their, their summer by Lake Geneva, boating on the lake and having lovely picnics, but instead were forced inside by the coldest summer in, in Geneva's history and by lashing storms and extreme weather, uh, and that's Tambora weather. And uh, because they didn't have the internet and Instagram, they were thrown back <laughs> on their own resources uh -huh. and decided to initiate a ghost story competition. And uh, Mary Shelley's contribution was, was Frankenstein. Um, Percy Shelley called it a storm lash novel. And if you right. remember, there are a lot of right. descriptions of um, cataclysmic storms and the birth of the, the monster and such. And uh, it, the, the argument or the image that I want to put in the reader's mind in the book is that we need to put the, tam uh, the writing of Frankenstein in the context of a humanitarian, in crisis, a humanitarian crisis that was engulfing Europe. You had tens of thousands of people uh, peasantry in particular, leaving their farms and villages for want of food and taking to the highways and byways of Europe um, and, and uh, going to the market towns, trying to find, trying to find food. I mean, it was a, star, it was a, um, a famine, a, a subsistence crisis. Uh, and if you think, if you look at, if you look at the story of Frankenstein, of the monster in particular, through that lens, he's this kind of benighted, monstrous uh, figure Lady, uh, who's a, a kind of refugee, being uh, hounded uh, across the um, uh, across Europe, uh, he becomes a kind of figure for the um, for the environmental refugee in, in Europe in those years. I mean, and country after country is being uh, swallowed up by a, 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 an epidemic of typhus as well. So the idea of a kind of a disease carrying, starving, potentially violent. Um, peasant population of Europe, which is a real threat to the metropolitan centres of Europe in, the, in between 1816 and 1818, becomes embodied in the monster of, and, and the threat, the threat of the monster and his his um, his odious appearance. Right, it's a fascinating story and and you know, pretty strong allegorical implications for present day. You know, sort of migrants here, uh, extreme weather there. Um, it's such a great book. Uh, thank you for writing it, and thanks for sitting down and talking with us today. It's great to have you at BYU. Oh, thanks so much, Matt. I enjoyed myself. Thank you. Thank you.